Good afternoon all members and guests of the IET London Network and the Railway Engineers Forum. I'll introduce myself first because uh, there's a number of you I haven't met before. Uh, my name is Xen Christodoulou and I'm the chairman for the IET London Network. The IET London Network are the host for the event today and the event was a collaboration with the Railway Engineers Forum. So the network, a few words about the network first, is run by a group of volunteer members from different sectors of the engineering profession and we're split into a number of geographical sections. This is the Central London Network and the host for tonight. Each sector has its own committee and budget from the IT to run events like this. The aim of uh, the group is to promote the IT mission and strategy which is to inspire, inform and influence the global community of young engineers, supporting and promoting technology, innovation to meet the needs of society. And hence, we run these events here to inform both members and non-members, everybody's welcome. Uh, I've got to admit I was concerned about the timing of the event today, uh, being in the middle of the Easter school holidays, that it would prevent many of you turning up, but delighted to see we managed to attract a large number of people wise enough not to brave the uh, Easter break getting out of London. We've got a free run for our event tonight, meaning that we haven't got any planned fire drills. Now, in the unlikely event, we will be called to evacuate the building. I'd like to ask you to follow with the fire exit signs, which are at the back of the room in an orderly manner, please, and gather underneath Waterloo Bridge which is to the left of the exit of the building. Uh, we're going to wait there for instructions from the fire warden. In the event we're not able to return, we have got a backup plan, and the backup plan is to gather at the coal hole, where I'm told they've got a good selection <laughs> of beverages, and I'm sure uh, Rufus will stay with us until he has to escape. Now, I should mention that the event I mentioned already is a collaboration with the Railway Engineers Forum. It's quite important to us to do these collaborations and it was quite easy because this is a rail-related event to get additional publicity through the other institutions. So special thanks to the IRSE, the IMA Key, and the Railway Technical Network of the IET. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I've got to confess my own special interest in the event tonight. I have worked within the railway industry for over 30 years now and lived through several transformations that had a profound impact on my professional and personal life. So I expect you share my curiosity to find out what to expect from the next shakeup of the railway industry and hence why uh, so many of you are here tonight. So, We've heard ambitious changes are coming to Britain's railways to address today's challenges and make rail simpler and better for years to come. So tonight we have the opportunity to catch up on the latest developments with regards to rail reform and the work underway to create great British railways. Now, Rufus Boyd is a distinguished railway professional and an old colleague of mine. I suspect many of you here will have a similar claim. He is a key member of the Great British Railways Transition Team and as a Programme Director for Passenger and Freight Services at GBRTT, Rufus is leading the charge on the development of GBR's clear long-term direction and joined up decision-making across the railway system. In tonight's presentation, Rufus will focus on the implications on whole system thinking in incentives as service contracts the crucial role of the supply chain in innovation and delivery, and the ever thorny issue of how to manage research, development, and innovation. These are complex topics that require a deep understanding of the industry, and Rufus is the perfect person to guide us through them. Now, I was having a chat with Rufus earlier, and he did say he's not an engineer, but I know he's worked with uh, plenty of engineers, so we're in good hands. Oh. Rufus has a wealth of experience in the rail industry, having held various positions in both the public and private sectors. He is a passionate advocate for sustainable, efficient, and customer-focused rail services, 
and is dedicated to driving positive change in the industry. So, without any further ado, can you please give a warm welcome to Rufus as he shares his insights on the Great British Railways and its role in shaping the future of rail services in the UK. Thank you, Zen, for those kind uh, warm words. Uh, I didn't recognise uh, myself particularly in the introduction, but thank you very much anyway. Uh, and for those of you um, who are here, I think, to be in a debate, not in a lecture, I have determined that we'll try and give more time to Q&A and less time to the lecture component of this, and I hope that suits your needs as well. Uh, needless to say, uh, Cognitive dissonance could have been the basis of this lecture because I have proofread this four times and it's still got the wrong date on it. Uh, so um, that, that's, the, that's the magic of template uh, PowerPoint. Uh, but what I think is appropriate is to uh, start with a very, very simple question is what are my prejudices? Because I think actually Zen is right to declare an interest uh, and so should I. And, and this is a bit about me. Uh, because I think it's important that when you hear people talk about things, you understand where they are coming from. And I uh, unambiguously uh, am a career commercial manager. I have done, and you'll see it all on the uh, left-hand side, I have negotiated track access agreements uh, with what was then South Central, now you would know as Southern. Uh, I have designed payment mechanisms in Australia. I have been sponsor for timetable changes, a bid director, and indeed I was an operator of last resort advisor for several years with the department. Uh, and that is where I come from. But there's another prejudice that I think it's sensible to acknowledge, that that 35-year career in commercial management uh, has st started uh, in the nationalised era. When I joined in 1987, slightly longer than when uh, Zen joined, uh, we had an unambiguously nationalised railway and it wasn't even a twinkle in anybody's eye that it would be privatised. In fact, famously, it was said that Margaret Thatcher would not contemplate it as a, a privatisation too far. But within 10 years, the sector had indeed been privatised. And we use the word privatisation, but I remind people that three things happened and they're all materially relevant to where we are today. There was indeed the introduction of private sector capital uh, and there was something which was equally important, which was liberalisation. There was competition in effect on track and there was competition for the right uh, for the market. That gave us both open access on the one hand uh, and indeed freight operations and gave us, importantly, the franchise system. And thirdly, and this is the thing that I think is playing out today, there was fragmentation. Uh, the sector was uh, broken up into over 100 separate companies, all with a distinctive role to play, and quite a lot of effort, incidentally, put into making sure that they could play that role. Uh, and I think we had a very successful 10 to 15 years under that model. Uh, but that model has come to a natural end, uh, and we'll move on to what that has meant for us. But the key prejudice I bring to you is I saw all this before it happened and I sat through it as it happened and indeed played quite relevant parts to it. And that might help explain why I'm back here. Uh, but I would also uh, note, as Zen kindly did, that in an august body of engineers and technical experts, uh, I am not unfamiliar with what bringing technology to rail can do. Uh, and you'll see on the right-hand side some of my credentials. I was uh, a signalling scheme sponsor. This was when I first met Zen. I was this scheme sponsor for the West Anglia route modernisation. I was project director for HS2's rolling stock uh, technical and economic advisor team. I was the shadow operator in Sydney Metro, and you can see it all out there. Because I think there is a natural integration of commercial and technical thinking, and it stops preferential engineering, uh, and it also drives forward value, and I think it, uh, it is a useful marriage that we have to reignite in the sector. Uh, but as I stand before you today, I'm the Programme Director, Passenger and Freight Services, 
Uh, and my functional accountability, which I think Zen had a good go at, but it's quite difficult to explain, is in a world of policy wonks, I am saying, will that really work on the real railway? And trying to make sure that that does come to pass. So what's the uh, route map for the evening? Uh, broadly speaking, I'm going to start with the crisis of 2018, uh, which was not a unique and acute crisis, it was merely the crystallisation of some long-standing problems. Uh, I will pass us through the white paper. Many of you will be familiar, but I think one of the really interesting things is about uh, how much the white paper has had to be adapted post-issue. I then think we'll spend some time on... Uh, GBRTT, the role I play and the role others play in making transition a reality. What that will mean for GBR, the kind of setup we envisage, and I have to say here and now, you know, this is all subject to government approval. So what I'm uh, talking to you about today is work in progress. Very interested to hear what you think about it, uh, but fundamentally still a function of government approval. Uh, and obviously the part that the rest of the sector will play with GBR. And then finally, a few thoughts uh, addressing the themes about how transformation will exist with a particular bias towards uh, tech and R&D issues. So I'm, if I was comfortable with this clicker, I'd be absolutely sure that what was behind me was where I thought I'd be, but it's not quite right. Um, so this is the Williams Review. This is the kind of 101, so you don't have to read it of the Williams Review. Uh, a reminder of who Keith Williams was, incidentally. Keith Williams was uh, from John Lewis uh, and British Airways, uh, and although he's now uh, known for his work in the post office, he had a very clear-eyed view about what was wrong with the railways and particularly how it might be remodelled uh, as a, a new, if you will, a new model of private-public cooperation and collaboration. What he identified, because there was both the review and there was the white paper that followed it, uh, and I'm going to be very strict to the words here, was six enduring issues. Uh, the first of which was that the rail sector often lose sight of its customers, acknowledging there and then that customers meant both passengers and freight forwarders. And this was reflected quite simply in customer satisfaction and performance metrics that by the time of 2018, we were struggling to continue to secure an upward trajectory uh, in those measures, and they are the critical measures of our future success. The second thing he observed was that we were missing substantial opportunities to work with communities. Um, ultimately, uh, communities are served by railways. Railways do not serve themselves. And in effect, we'd not really caught up with the devolution agenda that had been going on in the political environment. And it was quite clear that if you looked in Scotland or you looked in London, when railways became more subservient to wider strategies, uh, better outcomes were achievable. And for those of you who saw the transformation of, of Silverlinks uh, operations on the North London Line, East London Line and so on, in, into the modern London overground, you will see what the nature of that transformation brought by way of benefits. The third observation was fragmentation, and I talked a bit about reminding people about what the three features of privatisation were. And fragmentation wasn't just a problem, it was a problem because it made accountabilities challenging. Uh, and I think that is probably the key thing that what we're about to do uh, with our own work at GBRTT will try and reverse. The sector lacked strategic direction, and that was very clear to him, and I think uh, that also reflected, I think, some of those earlier points I was making about what successes had been secured in London. I think it was about whether decisions were made on a whole industry basis, i.e. there was strategic change, or whether indeed uh, there was any material reference to a strategy when those changes were made. And it's an observation I make, uh, as you know, joining in 87, that some of the things that the privatised railway survived on were systems and processes that had been built up under BR. So when one looks at the Magstripe system 
if you looked at all cats, if you looked at effectively Capri into Lenin, we were surviving on things that were pulled together under the nationalized era because you could make those sector-wide changes with strategic purpose. Uh, and it has been very, very difficult to secure that level of change across the sector under the old model, what one might describe as the current model. Point five is that it, the railway desperately needed to be more productive. And this was not new news in 2018 when Williams kicked off his review. We had had the McNulty review previously. Unit costs were relatively out of control and so were costs of big investment. The problem, and this is a personal opinion, is that revenue growth had washed away the sins of operational cost change. And as long as revenue growth always outstripped costs, then you could hide that sin. But when COVID, and it was slightly before COVID you started to see it, crystallized revenue stalling, and then costs didn't change, then the financial crisis emerged from that. Now, that, those uh, enduring issues were all absolutely brought to a head by COVID, and particularly the financial crisis facing rail. Uh, but we will uh, we'll come back to that. So a reminder about the plan for rail. So the Williams Review was a diagnostic. The plan for rail, which was a white paper, was what I think was a very ambitious and wide-ranging solution. Uh, it was not just Williams who wrote it, of course. It was a government document, so it, it came with uh, Grant Shapps' name attached to it. It undoubtedly had the full support of Boris Johnson, who took much of what he knew about railways from his time as the mayor in London. Uh, and it had uh, a lot of editorialising uh, from Andrew Gilligan. It, it was a good document. It was easy to read, in my view. Uh, but it didn't necessarily settle all the policy issues that government needed to wrestle. And I'd like to draw attention to three of the ten up there, which I think are still contended and are not yet fully settled, although I think uh, I am certainly very clear where the direction of travel needs to be. The retail revolution that needed to transform the customer experience, Williams was very strong on this, would mean uh, GBR materially stepping in uh, to the sector to create a more consistent retail experience. Uh, and that is a really important point for us at GBR, uh, but it obviously uh, creates quite a important new uh, public sector force, uh, and we need to reflect a little on how that balances out in a market, which genuinely I think everybody wants to remain liberalized. One thinks of the role of certain independent retailers in this regard. The second thing is, Whilst there was a clear set of statements on working with the private sector in the white paper, it was really not settled what that really, really meant. Not just for train operators, but for the supply chain as well. And that is still contended to this day, but as I said, I think we are getting closer to consensus. And then finally, number four, it was quite clear that with the uh, revenues no longer washing away the sins of cost, there needed to be a new financial settlement. And in truth, I don't think everybody in the railway has understood that reform, if it is to proceed to this template, has got to deliver a serious realignment of costs in the sector. And I don't think, I think particularly the Treasury, is unconvinced that the railway truly owns that problem. I think I do, I think Andrew Haynes does, but I don't think it believes the sector does yet. So that's an important feature of contention at the moment. Uh, I talked a bit about COVID crystallizing the problems of rail. A lot of people say, well, we've recovered, right? I was on a train the other day, it was full, so we're, we're back, right? Well, not quite. Williams was conceived pre-COVID, uh, but the white paper was drawn up with COVID very much in people's minds and the effect of COVID uh, on uh, revenues very, very clear. And I thought I might just run through some data now for people's wider benefits. But before I do, would some of the people at the back like to take a seat and promise you it won't disrupt? It's a, I'm going to do a lot of talking and you're going to do a lot of standing and that can't be right, can it?
so the, the recovery has been quite robust. I mean, certainly when I was starting uh, looking at this problem, I set up the Rail Revenue Recovery Group uh, uh, over two years ago now to deal with this issue. We were talking about potentially an 80% recovery. Well, here we are at 90% of revenue recovered. Um, and broadly speaking, two or three percentage points more in terms of journeys. But we have to be clear about what kind of problem that still leaves us. Because what's happened is that the mix has changed quite seriously. And in the red, you'll see leisure is outperforming uh, the sector as a whole, about 108% of pre-COVID. Commuting is about 83%. Uh, we thought it was lower, but when we analysed how people were reporting themselves uh, on Wavelength, the customer survey, they were not necessarily reporting the way we would have reported, but it's about 83%, and business about 35%. Now, for those of you who are familiar with revenue and revenue elasticities, what you will discover, of course, is that all the high-yield traffic is way below what it was and the low yield traffic uh, leisure, which is an important part of the mix, is overperforming. So the consequence on our total revenue of the new mix is quite serious. Another couple of other points, people will see this is nominal, not real. We're in a period of high inflation, so costs aren't nominal. Uh, they're, they're going, I mean, sorry, costs aren't uh, matching this, they're uh, outrunning this again. And finally, the extraordinary success of the Elizabeth Line uh, represents some of the numbers here. Now, I know the Elizabeth Line, in effect, is gluing a couple of old railway uh, railways together through the central core, but the Elizabeth Line is driving a lot of this current growth, and that is, uh, while really welcome, uh, relatively low yield. One of the positive things that's going on in the background is that industrial action now looks to be... Uh, potentially over, or materially over at least. What that's revealed is that yes, we were losing money on the day of a strike, but actually passenger confidence was really quite low. And that we've not just had the bounce back of the individual days not being in our base, uh, but actually confidence is returning to people and they're coming back. So I think next year will be a better year. Uh, we won't just stabilize at this 90%. I think there is more to come. But the bill for COVID, for industrial action, uh, has been huge. And over the past year, it's about 2 billion, with an effective run rate of something like 1.2 billion, if we were to take the latest period, for example. So we are still having to address not just the bill that must come from reform. There's got to be a business case for reform. We still have a bill for just not having enough money in the bank post-COVID. Now, if I was to say, well, look, we've got some financial challenges, but is the structural problem still there? Uh, now we're nearly five years on, four and a half years on from William starting the review. And the answer unambiguously is yes. Uh, on the left-hand side, I give you some pretty strong examples, I think, of why the status quo remains uh, intolerable and unsustainable for various reasons. The first of which is we have really not just caught up with change. I talked about devolution earlier. I talked uh, a little bit uh, about the uh, issues arising from uh, people's uh, commuting habits changing in the last slide. But I would add to that issues such as sustainability, which are now very, very real. Uh, and the, the sector model as existed has just materially changed. We should acknowledge that in most of our, I can't think of anyone in this lifetime unless someone was alive in the Second World War, uh, the railways are more directly controlled than in any time in living memory and possibly even in history. And that is not an effective way to run a railway. We have a very clear set of problems. Williams was very clear. Uh, I think these remain real. Improvements either take too long to deliver, fares and ticketing are a very good example of that, uh, or they under-deliver and cost too much. We get a lot of talk in the sector about you know, great projects, transformational projects, and I use the example of Thameslink unashamedly. It's a fantastic project, 
but it is not actually delivering the trains per hour it said it would deliver. And that story is repeated through big investments all over the railways. Uh, and it's something that has to change. Now, it either changes by those projects being able to meet those deliverables, or we have to be clear-sighted uh, about the limits of the ability of the railway to run. And I think we had a real exposure to that in 2018 in the north around the Audsall called Curve. And finally, I think we still haven't really cracked how to manage timetables effectively. The timetable set up in uh, privatisation era was, era was a railway that had capacity to grow, and boy did it grow. At the margins, uh, I was involved with uh, some colleagues in the room setting up Gatwick Rugby, for example. I helped facilitate the slightly improbable Ipswich Basingstoke. Uh, we did a lot of things to grow the railway because the railway had space. Well, the space has gone. It's gone, and we don't really have a mechanism for making sure that with very little space left, that we are truly optimising our timetables for best use. And we've got to get that in play. So what we're going to have to do, you know, what is the moral imperative? Well, that's more on the right-hand side. I think we've got to bring track and train back together, and I think we're just simply arguing about how best to do that, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that later on. It's track, train and talent, of course, because it is about people. We've got to bring commerciality back into the railway uh, and, and actually get it driven by passengers and the revenue they bring and freight and the revenue that brings. I do believe that collaboration, and I don't mean that in a soft sense, I mean it in a very uh, formal, contractual sense, needs to be brought into railway without losing the clarity of accountability that's essential uh, to get things done. We do have to address this issue of local needs uh, and particularly respond to the devolution agenda. Uh, and we've got to give those big numbers, uh, get those big numbers under control that are letting us down and are not giving us the trust across the government that we need, particularly with the Treasury. Now, the question of whether the government is behind this is quite important because there was a brief period, and we can call it the period around the trust government, and that's not anything to do with trust, but I think it was the political turbulence of the time. There was a doubt that the government was actually committed to its own policy, and that's quite an extraordinary thing. But I think what we've discovered with Mark Harper, who is pretty agnostic on the role of rail, actually. He doesn't have railways in his constituency. He's, he's, not, a, uh, he's not a particular advocate of rail. But Mark Harper took time to apprise himself of what the plan was and declared himself an advocate. And he stood up at the Bradshaw Address and made a series of important statements about how he saw it. The first of which was, uh, I think, inevitable, a statement that this was going to be a customer-led railway where they were put first uh, and it was not going to be a production-led railway that this would be delivered through GBR, uh, that the private sector would have a critical role, and if this had got lost in the period since the Williams Review and the White Paper, he was putting it back at the centre. And that is a key moment for us. I remember, I remember I talked about the three contended issues arising from the plan. This tried to deal uh, with the uh, second of those issues. Did we truly understand the role of the private sector? And they'd be pretty good to their words. They uh, supported in that period since Harper came in, uh, Great British Railways HQ being in Derby. Uh, they've continued to commit to fares, ticketing and retail reform program, which incidentally is separately budgeted from GBRTT. They're still committed to a long-term strategy for rail, and I'll explain why that matters. And some subsidiary things that I've talked about here, freight growth targets and so on. The key issue is, do we get legislation? And Mark Harper was very clear that he was not in a position to declare legislation. That was a whole of government decision. And there were more people asking for legislative slots than there was space. So we await the view. We remain absolutely convinced that if you want to maximize the benefits of reform, legislation is to be had. If you don't have legislation, you can still have GVR, you can still have a long-term strategy, you can still have fares ticketing retail reform. But it might leave undecided some relevant issues, and that might cause us 
to continue to obsess about the true nature of reform in, until legislation comes forward. What are we doing? So this is the simplified version of the slightly longer slide you're going to see in a bit. We have a clear purpose. This is something we live by internally, and Zen very kindly read the rubric at the start. We are here, and our purpose is to create a simpler, better railway for everyone in Britain. It absolutely guides our thinking. It is very, very difficult to make real because of the nature and the complexity of a contractual environment like the railways we are in. But we do it by putting the customer at the heart, customer at the heart of our thinking. And when we think about building systems and processes and institutions, the key mantra is, is it simpler, better? Now, you'll know that GBRTT is led by Andrew Haynes, uh, who is Chief Executive of Network Rail. We, if you want the simple model, there are two key tasks. We are building a new public body, GBR, who will plan and run the network, and we will create a better railway from now. So there's the immediate action, then there's the institutional building. But to be more precise about those priorities, uh, I've set it up at this table. This is um, a, a synthesis of work. It's just a, it was a way of getting it on a slide. So don't take it too literally. But on the uh, left-hand side, broadly, is a summary of our goals. Yes, a simpler sector. That's very much about uh, design and transformation and getting the commercial framework right. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a later slide. It's a bit about aligning the industry, and that's about the strategy. And again, I'll talk about that in the later slide. Yes, once again, cost effective, putting customers at the heart of it. And I think the most immediate thing we can do is to transform the retail experience. Our chairman, Peter Lord Hendy, uh, when he was transforming uh, Transport for London said, it has to start with the retail experience because the retail experience is the barrier that stops non-users coming to rail. You can sort out the rail experience for the users, that's a good thing, and maybe they advocate for you, but the thing that stops anybody joining you is making buying a ticket complex. And I think he's 100% right. We'll talk a little bit more about FTR later. And then finally, and a lot of people I meet uh, uh, take this very, very seriously, we've got to change the culture. And that's not just about a customer focus, but it's about a commerciality. And in the sidebars and around uh, tea today, I heard a lot of people talking about a culture that remains slightly risk averse in the industry, people afraid to move, uh, people having no jeopardy from not moving and no reward for taking risks. And we've got to change that. Now, I talked about two priorities, uh, well, I talked about the, uh, the six goals, um, but actually I talked about two priorities, building a better future uh, and starting things today. And I want to talk a bit about long-term strategy for rail. Long-term strategy for rail, it was formerly known as the WISP for people who can't quite follow the bouncing ball. Uh, Long-term strategy for rail is a 30-year evidence-based strategy that will set the direction for rail. You might think, oh my lord, not another document. We don't need a document, we need action. But the truth is, is that the strategy isn't a document, it's a framework for decision making. And if you look in London, where the railways is subservient to educational outcomes, jobs and employment, leisure outcomes, moving people around the city, you can see how it can transform. And the railway takes its true role. We've seen something very similar uh, in Scotland, opening up the borders, you know, creating connectivity uh, to achieve things. We're seeing uh, new lines opening even now and electrification to bring sustainability benefits. Strategy determines what railway does next. And that's a really, really important thing. Now, the government has bought into this very clearly and was prepared to set out five strategic objectives for rail. They're set out on the right-hand side, and for those who uh, find it difficult to see from the back, that means meeting customers' needs, delivering financial sustainability, contributing to long-term economic growth, levelling up and connectivity, and delivering environmental sustainability. Now, for me, that is a hugely important statement because this is not about a free-for-all 
in which uh, the person who gets their track access uh, requirements in first and bids to run a service first and secures the maximized profit for that service. It's not going to be just on that, it's going to be economic outcomes where appropriate. Uh, and that's a key change for us. It doesn't mean everything will be planned by GBR. There is still room for open access, there is still room for freight. That's been clearly stated several times. Uh, but what it does mean is we'll be taking an economic assessment as well as a purely financial one. Now, I talked a bit earlier uh, about priorities, about design. And I talked a little bit about the role of the private sector challenge, the one set out by Mark Harper. Uh, this is work in progress, but it's uh, something I'm uh, deeply involved in at the moment and would like to therefore spend some time talking about. If we are going to create a customer-led commercial railway, it cannot be run by the infrastructure manager. That is self-evident. And because GBR owns the infrastructure manager, then you've got to create a world in which you have a collaborative partnership with train operators that forces the right level of commerciality into the system. By commerciality, we often mean single P&L, a place where costs and revenues come together and decisions are made on that basis, duly accounting for some of the economic outcomes we're trying to achieve as well. We think, broadly speaking, this is the model for delivery, that if you want a set of customer outcomes, then they will be brought together between the infrastructure division and the one or two passenger service operators operating in any given area. Some will be contracted, PSEs, some will be managed by scorecards, uh, and some will be part of the liberalised environment of open access and so on. Or they may be uh, devolved operators operating under uh, devolved government business. I think the natural enterprise unit is something that has a human scale. It would also have a familiar kind of railway feel to it. It would be something the size of Anglia, something the size of Wessex. It may have one or two train operators in them acting as PSEs. It may have uh, an open access operator on. It will almost certainly have freight. That business unit is the natural and I think efficient level for managing the system. By contrast, when we talked about the long-term strategy, uh, when we talk about financial consolidation uh, and big, big investment, I think the natural and efficient unit of planning and strategy is the region. We don't have any particular desire to muck around with the regional railway geography. Indeed, the white paper was very clear that was probably a fool's errand. But I think the business unit, the enterprise unit, and how that is sized is still up for grabs. Um, but it is a, a key feature uh, of this for us. And how do we make it all work? Well, I've put some of those things in the dot points. You're going to need uh, aligned targets and objectives. You're going to need commercially-led decision-making, which means you need a financial framework and a single P&L. Uh, you're going to have to have shared delivery plans. I mean, one of the things that are quite frustrating about in the last uh, dozen years or so in the railway is how often what the train operator was being asked to do by the department was not precisely the same thing that was being done under regulatory settlements with all the mismatches you might imagine happening. So yes, you get an integrated P&L, and what you get is a chance to be uh, the local accountable champion for rail within that business unit, and I think that is a return to a, I've used the word human scale before, a sensible human scale for bringing the railway together and creating accountability. Uh, I think Jan Looker spoke to me in the earlier session in the, in the tea room, and said, you know, how's this all going to be managed in terms of metrics? And I said, look, I think there are three metrics that have got to be common nationally uh, and which we would wish both the operators and the infrastructure managers to be uh, held to account for. Customer advocacy, I think that's something like net promoter score. There's lots of technical ways you can make net network promoter score work. Uh, operational performance, it's got to be single, it can't be blame game. So we'll be looking at something like average passenger lateness. And then something about net revenue, 
we've used the term bottom line here, but something about net revenue. These are critical incentives that we've got to push right down and have got to be shared across uh, the sector. Well, that, that was about the uh, operators, but I want to talk a bit about the wider role of the PSC because I think this is critical to innovation. Uh, in loose talk, people assume that the, uh, the franchise operators, now the PSC operators of the future, are where all of or most of innovation and private sector enterprise come from. And yet the reality pre-COVID was 80% of railway spend, that's about 20 billion, 16 billion or 20 billion, uh, was through the private sector. So everybody who plays a part in the private sector has got something to offer in both creating that recovery where we get the revenue in the top line right and close that gap between 90 and 100% and make good the 2 billion shortfall this year or 1.25 billion per year at the current run rate. So how do we do that? I think the starting point is bringing P&L together at a point where decisions are made. So uh, it's important that those who buy things, and I think for the most part that is a business unit level, although occasionally it's a network level, those people are incentivized by P&L and they should be the people who are demanding innovation. I think the second thing we need to do is we need to move away with an obsession that innovation is just kind of first of a kind tech. Innovation is anything that makes things simpler and better. And in some cases, and this is a terrible truth about railway today in Britain, it may just be best practice that people have been doing elsewhere for quite a while. The innovation comes with actually embedding it institutionally in a complex environment. So we put a really high value and put a premium on the values that the private sector bring to the railway. And we uh, spend quite a lot of time at the moment uh, through an industry process we've set up called a sounding board, uh, where we've invited supply chain in to come and talk to us about the barriers. And I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Uh, I've also personally, and tomorrow I'm in Doncaster for what it's worth, I've done a number of round tables in the regions, talking to local British suppliers and saying, you know, what would make life better for you? How can we make your life easy so you can help us deliver this challenge? They have not been backward in coming forward. And this is broadly what they've said. Businesses have told us that we're too slow, uh, and we're not just talking about network rail here, we're talking about the railway generally, whoever the procurer is. We are too siloed and we are too prescriptive. And I'm sure that they've felt that for a long time, what we have made very clear to them is we have heard that and we are responding by saying we will be strategic and we will give you the strategic direction you need. We will be better coordinated. We will create a commercial environment with the right imperatives, noting that if we're going to push decision making down, that the supply chain has to accept that sometimes things will be done differently in different places but I think most suppliers are familiar with that. And where it's important that it's all done one way, then we will provide the proper whole system analysis and support to make that case. It will also be a competitive environment that suits creating the right outcomes from competition and not the deleterious race to the bottom ones. And certainly whenever we get onto the subjects of skills or get onto the subject of innovation, what we hear is, we would do that for you, we promise, but if you're not scoring that in the competition, then we will not make that investment, we will just go lowest price. You know, we have to come good on that. And I hope that with a long-term strategy, which will give suppliers confidence on things like decarbonisation, uh, with the uh, pushing down of P&L, with the right incentives, all of those things are achievable, as well as, I think, very constructive engagement. So if we're empowering and localising, I've talked a bit about this risk of, are we going to end up doing things differently? Well, what are we going to do? I just wanted to reflect on a few areas where I hope we will retain a national and network perspective because I think these are the game changers for us. Fares ticketing retail, I'm going to talk about it in the next slide and it'll be my last slide which I think is critical. We cannot have a proliferation and a thousand flowers blooming in retail. 
we need to give a coherent portal for non-users as well as users. I think that is equally true of customer information, uh, obviously driven, I say obviously, but I think it should be driven by an open data concept. We shouldn't hoard information, we should let others uh, spread it, uh, but we will have to provide the base data that's good enough to do that. Uh, I think there's a huge thing on accessibility that very few people acknowledge unless that matters to them, uh, and the role we play in providing a national strategy is key, and indeed a, a national railway accessibility strategy is one of our current commissions from the department. And there are some examples of where we have got to do things for ourselves. Not everything will be about customers, it'll be making life easier for ourselves to be better. Uh, we are producing a data, and, uh, sorry, two strategies actually, a data strategy and a digital strategy to focus on that. I think there's huge issues which we won't deal with at GBRTT, or certainly until we take over Network Rail, uh, on digital signalling. Uh, not a, a specialist subject, but I, I have had the full briefing on it and I am profoundly impressed by the opportunity. Possession efficiency has remained that pistachio in the bowl that no one can seem to pull open. Uh, we will try, and I think if we get P&L sorted and we use the right tech, that is up there. And I think we also need a culture where challenging standards is okay, and it is both sought, it is sought after by those who have their standards challenged as well as those who might perhaps whinge about them, but is done constructively, and that would be really important to me. So I'm going to end on a final slide about FTR, and partly because this is the jewel in the crown of our current work. In the, I said we're doing two things, we're planting trees for the future, but we're doing stuff now. FTNR, it's a £360 million programme uh, run by Stuart Fox Mills, uh, who came from a uh, commercial director at Abelio Group, uh, and a very good guy he is too. It's something of a revolution, but I suspect if we really looked at it, we'd find that it's really about rolling out best practice, uh, but in a way that's uh, not been done systematically across the system uh, since nationalisation. Key features, pay as you go, yield managed fares uh, with using the most modern systems, uh, customer experience transformation through loyalty programmes and modernising the experience at stations. And then finally, the big game changer, the online retail unit, which will pro provide common services to third party retailers, uh, as well as providing uh, a portal uh, with the uh, appropriate branding on it uh, that people can trust and say, well, uh, uh, you know, I have a default proposition, which currently is really through the NRES National Railway Inquiries Channel, which is really not quite at the level it needs to be to build trust and confidence in the sector. So that is our direction, that is what we are trying to achieve. I've given you three or four examples of very specific activities we're doing that we think will make a material difference. Uh, I'm very happy to push it on into Q&A if you think I've missed anything or there's anything you want to explore. Uh, but before I do that, I would just thank you and uh, give you a chance to uh, either follow GBRTT or uh, if you want to drop me a line, uh, follow me on LinkedIn. But thank you, I'll go to questions. Thank you, Rufus. Now we've got two volunteers with roving microphones. Who's going to have the first question? I see one over there, Nacha. Ladies first. Right, so. Ruth, you have the first go. Hello, Rufus. It's Ruth Humphrey here from Siemens, but I think you know that. Um, really curious about where the timeline really is at the moment. You sort of had a graph, the first one, which had a sort of few lines, but no dates. <laughs> right. Very happy. Um, so uh, we could talk about legislation all night. Legislation is really critical to the timeline, but not necessarily critical that, to GBR being set up. Legislation will be fourth session, if it happens, and we are hoping it will. That means it will be declared in the next couple of months. I suspect whether it's publicly declared is all a function of PERDA, uh, but we don't call it PERDA any longer, but um, uh, restrictions sitting around the local elections. Um, and then if that comes true, then by April 25, you will have a fully functioning authority 
that can let franchises or PSEs and, and, and. In reality, change would start in the autumn before that. So if you really wanted to see a GBR up and running, it would be late 24 after the bill had done due process. So the key issue in that, which I'm sure you would like to say is, so what is the risk on legislation? And I, I don't, I genuinely can't odds the risk, uh, but it's, um, it's really about what I spoke about earlier, which is the government has more business it wants to do than it has time and it has to take all those decisions in the round. Okay, yeah, the election is an interesting thing for uh, people here. We don't lobby out of government, but the Labour Party has come to us and posed the question, what are you doing? You know, how do we feel about that? I think the Labour Party is, broadly speaking, comfortable with this direction of travel. Um, I think if it were done, they would find a way to make, make it meet their agendas. They could make that happen. I think it's a very interesting question. This is a personal view. This is not a corporate view for what it's worth. Uh, I think a lot of current politics is about wedge issues. I'm not quite sure why anyone would make the railways a wedge issue. I think this is about running fundamental services for Britain. I would have thought political consensus was a good thing, uh, but I'm not a spad and I'm not a, you know, I'm just not one of those guys. But uh, yeah, I mean, it would have a Labour Party flavour, wouldn't it? But um, yeah, I think they'd support it. Thank you. Nacho, we have one. Hi. Oh. Hi, Rufus. Uh, really interesting talk, so thanks very much. I'm Tom Mason from KPMG. Uh, two questions, if that's all right. One was, uh, I saw the slide with the, the sort of industry structure, and I think there was one uh, big body missing from that, so at least I can see it, which is the DFT. So how's the relationship between DFT and GBR going to change compared to NR? And then my second question is open access. So uh, what role do you see open access playing? Do you think it's larger than the current role open access operator play or, or smaller? Um, what, you know, what advantages do you see there? So thanks. Yeah, OK, so ha happily try and deal with that. So perhaps I'm not focused on the department because for me it's relatively self-evident. They have set up or are seeking to set up GBR to undertake the necessary planning and management of the network. In 2018, Chris Grayling woke up with a transport planning disaster on his hands because the May timetable had gone wrong, and then by December it hadn't got any better. And when he asked the question, whose fault is it? He said, well, technically, Minister, it all comes onto your desk because of the way we have this structure. Now, Chris Grayling, who has been much maligned in my opinion, that's a personal opinion, uh, realised that this was bonkers and it was he who initiated the Williams review. So if the government follows through on its policy, it would be my opinion that the right thing to do would be say, we set the guardrails and the policy framework, we set the financial framework, uh, we are still your shareholder, so we're going to want to talk to you, but frankly, please could you deal with every operational problem that has inadvertently ended up in our lap? and we've sub-optimised the civil service to, to manage that, but it's not really working. On the second question about open access, I think the, one of the weaknesses of uh, the railway's prosecution of the case for change post-Williams was it did not, it sounded as though for some reason it was either ideologically, theologically, if you will, anti-open access. Uh, I, you look at what it's done for communities in Hull, what it's done for places that were not well served by the franchise operation, who's going to take that off those people and say, no, it's the wrong model, I'll, I'll explain the economics to you in a bit. It's just not going to be like that, is it? Open access will provide consumers with benefits that it cannot get through other means. But what it can't do is run riot through a, a strategy that has communities served economic outcomes achieved. So what you're going to have to do is to find a space for open access to play in an auctioneering process which is fair and reasonable for that space. I think what that means is you're setting up, uh, as it were, predefined space for OAX to play in, or OAO, they now call it, used to call it OAX in my day, uh, to play in, 
uh, and then the, the system would be as now. Effectively, you bid for it and you, you get the outcome. But, but that's a bit me spitballing an answer because it's not that clearly laid out yet how that would work. But that's how I would see it working, which I think incidentally means it can grow if the, in the answer to your question. Thank you. Got a question here in that chair at the front. Okay, how will go first? Hi, hi thanks. Uh, Havinder Bhatia. Uh, question about standards, actually. And in the current industry structure, there's a role for RSSP on the standardization because of the infrastructure and the train operating companies and the interface that they come together at. In the future world that's being proposed here, would there be a need for such a body that's independent, or would that authority be assumed by GB Railways? Uh, so, uh, honestly, hand on heart, I have uh, no clarity on the future of the role of RSSB. I will declare an interest. The first job I had when I became an independent contractor was to work for the RSSB uh, to give their input into the Williams Review. So I, I made a case with Mark Phillips for why the RSSB had a role. I was very clear with Andrew Haynes. I said, I have to, you know, I'll declare that interest. Um, I think RSSB, and particularly the issue of how safety management will happen, which must necessarily embrace standards, I think, has yet to be determined. And Williams said, that let's not do this on the first pass. Um, what that means for the long-term direction, I don't know. I think standards have to exist. I think we have a pretty good structure in uh, Britain's railways for standards. I think RSSB are doing a good job. That's a very personal view. Um, but RSSB has grown its remit in a number of other directions. So I think there's a question of both scope and institutional uh, longevity and purpose that comes out of it. But genuinely, hand on heart, I don't know what the future of RSSB is and I've no, not heard people discussing it. And I think that was hinted at in the Williams Review as not to be dealt with initially. You've got Linda down the front if people have got a mic. Thank you. Linda Richardson, now retired. Um, I have to say, I came to a presentation many years ago, long before I retired, and uh, you alluded to the fact that the privatisation has filled all the white spaces in the timetable and we've yeah. now used capacity. Well, that presentation many, many years ago, the speaker was explaining to us that it's our physical infrastructure and signalling that is limiting in everything, and where we need to go and where we're going right now is what he said at the time um, is to follow the rest of the world where they have digital signaling so all the infrastructure can come down and it can tell exactly where a train is and how fast it's going so instead of always having to have this massive gap between trains if they're going slower in the peak you can actually have them closer together um, is that going to come and and do you know when it's going to come because Right. The presentation so, I went to years ago said it was almost on our doorstep then. Um, so the, the, luckily Zen's up here. I'm not going to pass this on to Zen. So uh, let, let's be clear, uh, we have really exhausted what colour light signalling can do for us, have we not? Uh, we've exhausted it for a number of reasons. Why we have now sub-optimised our capacity outcomes, which is true. Uh, it, I don't think it is particularly efficient in terms of the maintenance costs to spend 300 grand building walkways so somebody can walk safely to a signal that could all be done in cab or remotely. I think, you know, the benefit stream is huge, but this is big tech change. And on a liberalized multi-user environment, we're not a metro, you invariably have a huge stakeholder group of industry players who need to be satisfied to get it to work. Uh, but it is the future. Have I got timelines? No, I haven't. But if you want to know, have I drunk the Kool-Aid on digital signaling? Yes, I have. I mean, I really have. And I, look, I, you know, I'm serious about this. I, I know metros are different, but I went to uh, Australia to build a metro, and the, the dynamics of Australia in, in the early noughties, late noughties, was very, very hostile to metro. It was foreign. CBTC, we don't understand. You know, we're not interested, not here. We run Railcorp. And it's transformed the city. You know, it's absolutely transformed the city. And I'm sure digital signalling on conventional rail will transform our network. But I don't think 
even if we get good outcomes from the East Coast work, it just can't be rolled out like that, not on a legacy system. Unless you wish to argue with me, Zen. Fair answer. Uh, no, I am very pleased you haven't passed it on to me. <laughs> Thank you. Stay here for a Thank very you. long time. I just wished they found a different buzzword to digital signaling. We had digital signaling since the early 80s, yeah, but, yeah. you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, let's get another question. Uh, we have one at the back. Rufus, thanks very much for a really interesting and, and frank presentation. Um, my name's Richard Thurston from IDC. I'm quite interested when you're talking about the, your, your digital and data strategies. Um, I think every other industry has digitalized rapidly. Um, when COVID hit, everyone else had to. Um, maybe the railways had a problem with technology, hasn't been able to adapt. Um, you talk about culture needing to change. What are these kind of really big technology drivers that are going to happen, and how, how are you going to accelerate that? So uh, I think this is, again, a bit personal. So I'm, I'm quite close to the guy that does this in GBRTT, Russell Willans. Um, and I am convinced that the thing that will transform this for us is keeping the scope sufficiently limited that we could solve the question. The railways, along with many other bits of Britain, is very good at trying to solve a problem and then making it so big that it is beyond solution. So I've encouraged my colleagues uh, in the digital unit to think what would, A, what is coming, because there is some stuff that is coming anyway. You know, there's pre-agreed, pre-authorised uh, pre work. You know, let's acknowledge that those projects are on the pitch. And then how could we grow out of that? How could we develop them that, from that to get specific benefits uh, that would really drive the imagination of the sector to do more. As it happens, I believe, truly believe, that it will be the customers who will stare at disbelief at how we do some of our things, in the way they do with Magstripe certificates now, and just say, I cannot believe this is how you do your business. So I think anything that facilitates customer self-service, apps, customer information, you know, you look at the success of things like real-time trains. In, you know, who needs to know what, what the passing time at Hans Lake? You know, who needs? Well, people love it. You know, people walk towards this stuff. So for me, you know, look at what you're already doing. Look at what an incremental improvement might drive. Uh, my personal bugbear, for what it's worth, is we ought to know how well train any particular train is loaded on average and on, a, on any particular day in real time, because I think people would make sensible decisions on that basis. So I think customers will drive it. Thank you, Rufus. I've got a question there, Kaldeep. Uh, yeah, thank you, Zen. Thank you, Rufus, uh, for your insight. Uh, Kaldeep Gratia, Head of Engineering for TFL's major programs. You mentioned, I'm just gonna bring it back to the people, if that's okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you mentioned uh, culture, and you know, I think a clever person once said, you know, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Yeah. And, um, but you've not really mentioned any program or work package that is gonna change the culture, um, specifically in any of those work packages. I just wanted your view on that. And also, we do, I'm worried that systems thinking, or whole, whole systems thinking as we call it now, is becoming a bit of a buzzword. And um, what, what's actually gonna happen? Who's gonna do that? How is it gonna happen? Uh, are there any specific tools or, or is it just a switch? Okay, so let's deal with the latter one first, then come back to the culture question, because you're right, I mean, culture does eat strategy for breakfast. The, the bit about whole system thinking, let's not overcomplicate it. If you want a decision that embraces revenue and cost today, you would need the cabinet office to make that decision because the treasury owns revenue risk and the department owns cost risk. That is absurd, right? That has to end at some point. But if you said, okay, that's an aberration of post-COVID, what used to happen? Well, maybe it got through to the senior civil servant in the DFT. But what you didn't have was something you preciously had, for example, and I'm picking this as an example because it was true in the nationalized era, uh, in the sectorized era of late BR, you had, uh, directors of train operating units who had both infrastructure and trains on their patch. A number of us will have worked in that environment. 
and it was one of the most agile environments we worked in because the business case was all theirs to deal and that was all done as i said at that human scale so for me whole system thinking isn't about a com complex system integration it's about giving people clear p and l uh, visibility and as i said probably some economic analysis to support that on top and let them make the decision that is whole system let, i'm not trying to make it complex uh, on terms of culture, so we've got a problem, haven't we? Because the railway is now, you know, 110 businesses at 1995, probably 200 now. What are we going to do about that? Um, I think the first thing is the critical culture to get right will be that GBR starting culture is right. You can't do everybody, so let's start not at the top, but at the new institution has got to bring new culture and values. We will be taking over Network Rail. Network Rail is 40,000 people, so that's quite a leverage buyout, isn't it? So what are we going to do with culture there? Well, we're not going to make everybody's life miserable and difficult because you can't take them all off shift and have a culture day because railway stuff's running. So what are you going to do? You're going to remind them that they're in a new world where they have to be a servant to a commercial proposition. And that's going to be a key culture change, isn't it? What you do is for passengers, what you do is to support an operator in a whole system outcome. You're then going to be bringing in some people from the department, some people from rail delivery group, and every new institutional plug-in is going to need some degree of change program around it. But that is all in the future. That's 24, 25. Here today, the culture is all about GBRTT and what that means for GBR. And our HR director is leading on that. Thank you, Rufus. Um, Ramesh, we've got a question over there at the back. Yep. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> You're next, Steve. Hi. Thank you, Rufus. A very interesting talk. The um, thing that resonated for me was your definition of innovation and being embedment in a complex environment that yeah. seemed to me to pervade digital signaling and everything. However, that's not what my question is about, actually. Um, I'm interested in knowing what's happening for freight, yeah. and in particular, you know, what do you, I noticed it was on your list of the six priorities yeah. or five priorities. Yeah. So to what extent are you going to encourage modal shift onto the railways, yeah. and how far are you going to go? Well, obviously, when you're dealing with um, you know, actually private sector companies, and uh, you know, and there's obviously a question about how far you'll go and what you'll do to, to encourage that. Uh, so uh, yes, just, uh, just a, you, you quite rightly point out. I said six, and there were five. I'll tell you why there's six and not five. Is we forced the two customer ones together in that. So there is bringing customers back, and there's customers feeling a different. They're two separate goals. But yes, you're right. Well spotted. So, um, but that's just in case you think I'm misleading you. Uh, I am developing the nascent strategic freight unit, the SFU. The, you're quite right, it is a dominated by the private sector, the freight world. Um, and therefore the risk is that we get in the way and don't facilitate. So the SFU is trying to imagine a world where it facilitates. What are the facilitations it could do? Well, the obvious opportunities are um, reducing barriers to serve markets. So if there's some particular issue that happens to be there that is beyond private sector freight operating companies to resolve or terminals uh, managers to resolve, can we step in and make a difference? Uh, and so we would expect in due course to have more control and interest over uh, grant support, perhaps even help reshape the grant supports so that they better meet our needs. The second thing we would be hoping to do is to use the power that Network Rail has over terminals and connections to enhance the opportunities to serve the network. And actually, we're doing that live at the moment. So for freight watchers, you will have seen uh, up, at, um, um, Birm up in Birmingham near the uh, junction uh, there. I'm going to remember the notes. Baldersley, I think. Uh, there's a, we opened a new Semex terminal for them. Uh, we've done the same in Chessington. You know, we are being quite active in promoting the reopening of connections to expand the capacity of freight. And we can take that risk 
uh, over a longer term than, than say, the uh, customer can. Uh, we are very much hoping that we will be able to develop new markets. So uh, we have an extraordinary amount of interest in high-speed logistics, uh, effectively trying to map a rail solution to uh, what the Amazons of this world are doing today. How could we fit in to that model? Now, that is never going to replace the kind of volumes that coal did, but to have no footprint, or very little, we've got Varamis uh, doing some work there, but we don't really have a footprint for that. Can we do something? So I think stimulating new markets that we think are growing and relevant is important. Uh, because the truth is, is that a lot of customers, and I'm not talking about the freight operating companies, I mean the forwarders, are driven by sustainability outcomes. They're wanting to prove that they have the right level of uh, carbon emission footprint for their work and are looking to rail to answer that problem. And maybe the freight operators and maybe the uh, freight forwarders themselves can't resolve that. But critically, well, the first thing, like the doctors, do no harm. The first thing is don't get in the way of the private sector doing a good job. And, that, and that's a mantra we have been selling very hard to colleagues. And I hope that's a comprehensive enough view. But effectively, markets, terminals and barrier reduction would be the three things I'd set out. Uh, yeah, gentleman over there, you've got the uh, microphone. Hi. Manoj Agrawal from Softec Rail. GBRTT, how you are going to engage the customer? Is there any portal or mobile app to engage the customers and to, to get their feedback of what they need, where the things are going wrong in their journeys day to day? Uh, so, so that is my first question. Okay, right, yep. And second question, uh, in the last few years, uh, we have seen network rail assets have been decentralized into regions. The so GBRTT is planning to centralize them back again or, or will remain like that? Okay, I'll do them in reverse order in the traditional way. Uh, it is, you will be unsurprised that with Andrew Haynes leading both GBRTT and Network Rail that he said decentralization has to be our mantra. You know, we have got to, GBRTT has to follow what Network Rail has done and make local uh, executives and managers accountable for the performance of their railway. So we will not be uh, bringing things back to the network. I gave you a couple of examples of what I think are network significant projects and fares ticketing retail is a very good example. I think um, there will be a few others, but no, the network for the most part uh, will be involved with uh, issues like finance and assurance and so on and so forth. So you won't see delivery being accumulated back at, at the network level. Um, on, but, but I would make a point, this is just for people who are interested in the economics of rail, pushing things out is brilliant. But if you have five regions and you push things down to 13 routes, you've just found a whole lot more managers you've got to find. Uh, so the cost of devolution is high. So the benefits have to be great or you've got to be super ruthless. And I do think it's quite important that we don't have managers on managers on executives. So if you're doing something in the region like monitoring performance, that is not mimicked in the region by another person who does your job. Yeah. One person does one job, I think that's key. Coming back to the portal question, right here, right now, we're going quite old school on customer needs. Uh, we have a customer panel. Uh, we are you know, presenting issues with that. We've got a very big issue with customer care, in my opinion. Uh, how does the new model work when I've got a problem? You know, when I'm distressed about the journey I've just had, when I have uh, when I'm in mid-journey and I'm distressed, how do I, what is the balance of role between the operator and the network? And so we are going out and we're holding workshops and we're talking to people about specifically what the right answer might be to that. You can add a few more, lost property, left luggage, lots of stuff like that. But it's very much face-to-face. -face. It's not a ask everyone in the world their view. We've got pretty good views through the wavelength survey about how people really, really feel about, uh, you know, the railway they run on. 
Thank you. I think we had a question. Right, Colin. So, um, and I'm a signal engineer, a simple signal engineer. I think I understood most of your talk, uh, but what I still is not clear to me is this role of the private sector. And you've dressed it up quite well, and I thought confused the issue quite well as well. Uh, and I understand it's a very political issue between the government and, and the railway. But I didn't find that very clear. Which bit would you like clearer? Because I'd, I'd rather than repeat the whole lot. What specifically is your concern? Well, I, I failed to see how... Um, I found it difficult to see, unless you have a concession model, yeah. as opposed to a franchise model, how you can incentivize passenger operators to do better without having the full, you know, the problems that we have had with them. Okay, that, that's a good, good, good test, because I, I didn't pick it out. It's often one of the things we talk about. So uh, we have done some work with rail partners who are effectively an advocacy body for uh, operating owning groups to really get under the skin of this problem, because we thought we were pretty clear they thought we weren't, so we said, let's talk about what we believe. And we started using some more common terminology. So we think the government is going to buy three types of operator. It's going to buy a commercial partner, somebody that it would wish to incentivise to deliver to highly elastic markets like a high-speed long distance. That's one model. It doesn't have to be high-speed long distance, incidentally. Uh, but it would be a model where the, the conditions were right for passing risk through incentives. And it would be incentives, not full risk of the sort we saw in franchising. Because the concession model that we see in, say, North London, operated by TfL, has no revenue incentivization or risk. There is a hybrid, I believe, where incentives exist but not risk transfer. The second model would be uh, what we've called the collaborative model. And that would be very much like um, you would see in the TfL concessions, whether you looked at uh, DLR, Crossrail, or, or the London Overground model. That would be pure concession, please deliver for customers, high punctuality, high performance, and a series of outcomes like the gates will be monitored, the station will be open, it will be cleaned. And then finally, you have a change partner who is there with you in a complex and challenging world like TransPennine Upgrade, uh, or to take a more recent example through the Thameslink program. And in that case, you would be buying somebody who'd be working all that complexity through with you, and revenue incentives of any sort are almost meaningless to try and apply because change is everywhere, there's no baseline. So we've used those three models. We believe that if you're gonna work with the private sector in, in a kind of full fat model, you would be passing significant incentives for growth to them. Slightly fewer incentives in the collaborative model and almost none in the change model because you just can't pass that risk. So that, that's effectively the model we are proposing. Government has not declared its hand on whether it believes we've got that right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And there was a question here at the front. I think the word they used was stimulating. Stimulating, thank you for those thoughts. Yeah, not we agree. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, Gianluca Favalo from EY. Rufus, I mean, it's, um, it's about the private sector. It's not only operators, but they are a big part. Uh, stage, stagecoach is out, National Express is out, um, Abellio, possibly. Uh, who is taking responsibility for making sure that next time you go out to market, um, you're going to have people that want to play? Uh, so uh, the technical answer to your question, General Cruz, I think you know, but let's say it publicly. The department remains responsible for the design of the concession and therefore responsible for making a market. Uh, we have contributed to that debate in the way that kind of Colin posed the question by saying, 
it, it's quite a complex market and there's probably room for everybody to play. So let's say, and I'm just using these for instances, please don't take this as, uh, as God's own truth, but let's imagine an organisation like Serco or Arriva that's made a history of performing uh, tasks without revenue risk to a clear specification. They might be saying, well, I quite like the look of that collaborative model, maybe I can't chew on the, uh, the, the more commercial end of it, then you get an organization like First Group uh, uh, who would say, well, look, you know, hey, we run Avanti, we can clearly deal with your full fat incentive model. Uh, we'd be interested in that. We don't really like this concession model. Although, in my experience, of course, most of transit operators are prepared to operate in all. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I, we have not got yet the judgment of the market on any model. I think you will find that if you say to people, would you bid for this, they'll tell you all the reasons why you won't, because they want to change it to their advantage. The proof of the pudding will be when we put something out there. And I, and I am desperate to get back to competition. I don't have that accountability, but I'm desperate to help the department make that a reality. And then we'll know. Thank you, Rufus. And we'll take one last question at the end over there. Um, yes, it is one. Um, thank you. I'm, I've no connection with the rail industry. I'm an engineer, but I'm, um, I, my only connection is as a customer. And you mentioned the um, retail um, experience on several occasions in your yeah. talk. And the thing is, if I go to EasyJet, I can book a ticket next October at a good price. Last week, I tried to look for Stansted, a, a ticket to, for, to Stansted in July. There's no timetable. So as a customer, that's absolutely useless. So uh, you really need to improve the customer experience actually quite a lot. So, sorry, do you want an answer or is there a two-parter? No, that's it. <laughs> no, so I agree, 100%. Um, this is one of the functions of the state now controlling everything. We, if I believe you, and during COVID, we effectively started to institute longer booking horizons and simpler exchange policies to give people confidence in booking longer out. And we do think the airline model that says, I book 15 months out, but I reserve the right to put you to an adjacent train if the train moves for whatever reason, is a model that can work in the railways. It's not my accountability. A lady called Suzanne Donnelly, formerly Virgin, uh, East Coast, formerly LNER, is now working on those things. But we have to go to first the department with the Treasury sitting alongside them and say, will you wear this? And it, it's just very complex to get relatively simple innovations done. That has to change. I'm not blaming either of those two institutions, but we've got ourselves in the devil's own mess about being customer responsive and we have to do something about it. So I support your point entirely. And we do have it, it's called Project Horizon for what it's worth. We do have a project specifically aimed at that. Thank you, Rufus. I did say it was the last question, but I will use my uh, host privilege and add oh, a couple okay. of more, two, two small questions. So first one is, uh, what's being done to encourage SME engagement in both this planning stage and how do you see it in terms of delivering innovation in the future and not getting stifled by uh, framework contracts that Network Rail recently has been over-relying on. Uh, no, I love that question at all. And <laughs> the second one is uh, a different one is, how do you see, or, or do you see, is there any thinking on talking about creating value from exporting technology and know-how that being considered as a, um, a, a, a railway. Um, in terms of technology and engineering, uh, 30 years ago when I joined, I remember uh, many countries abroad were using our own standards and our own technology, and now we've fallen a bit behind. Uh, is there any thinking about creating value out of that? Uh, so reverse, reverse order again. Okay, so I talked to people about going around and doing these sounding boards. I did a sounding board in Reading the other day and people became hugely energised 
about whether GBR in the future could uh, have as one of its remits or as part of its wider duties an obligation to help uh, stimulate uh, exports as part of it. I don't think it can be quite as bold as that, but I do think it would be a very good outcome if we were developing processes, systems and tech that was exportable again, because you're quite right, you know, you look at Hong Kong Metro, you know, one of the best performing metros in the world, at least if you go back to the original lines, it was effectively a British turnkey project, or nearly, damn it. Uh, and even relatively recently, if you go down and look at how train in South Africa, we were able to do these things. We really should be able to do it. Uh, it would seem to be not a first priority. We've got to put our house in order. Uh, I'd make a very small point. I made a little bit of a career selling the one thing we were very good at, which is how to liberalise your railway. I mean, we had a huge white-collar export, which people like Jan Looker have been able to benefit from, where we'd go and sell payment mechanisms and liberalisation stories and narratives and processes to the Anglo sphere. Uh, and so, you know, why did we do that? Because you can take a view, well, you know, what kind of value add is that? Um, the answer is we did it because we took risks in the 90s that allowed us to learn and then export it. If we don't take risks, if we don't push out the boundaries, no one's going to buy our stuff because they can get it elsewhere because somebody's already doing it. So, yes, I support it. Don't load GBR with too many expectations per the earlier point. No problem is large enough that you can't make it so big you completely balls it up. Right, the second thing is... I personally have gone on record with uh, RIA, Rail Forum, and in the sounding boards to say I personally want uh, SME supply chains to profit from this change and this reform. And the problem with aggregating and guiding mind is it says precisely the opposite, doesn't it? If we just put our arms around everything, it would be good. So I have spoken to a number of people and said, what can we do for the SMEs that says you will have a part to play. I think even Network Rail would acknowledge that it has to think about its contract forms and we continue to work with Clive Barrington to see if there's things that can be done before GBR is set up to make it easier. Um, I think the reality though is we need both things, don't we? We need good suppliers who can integrate because I don't think we're going to take on integration roles. I think we need good suppliers who can integrate and we need to find relevant contract forms and incentives that stimulate SMEs, either through tier ones or directly with projects. And we just have to find a way. And I think, you know, I know people say, oh, HS2's got a mixed record on this. I mean, HS2 at least tried to do something, and I think we should try. If we have a mixed success, maybe that's it, but we should try. Thank you, Rufus. Um, so it's time for me to thank Rufus for agreeing to present here tonight a complex undertaking with much work still to do. I hope you'll agree with me that he has done a great job, uh, with the exception of getting the date wrong on the presentation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was Re the template. <laughs> reminding us of the Williams Rail Review, explaining uh, GBR's priorities and the railway long-term strategy and the role of the private sector in the success of the future railway sector and his own views and thoughts presented openly and charismatically. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank you for being a good audience as well. I was expecting uh, probably some uh, more challenges, but we're always very civil here at the IET. Uh, yeah. So the railways have seen cost and change since I joined shortly before the privatization of British Rail in 94. It's a bit of a history trip. Uh, we've seen the vertically integrated state-run British Rail organisations split into more than 100 companies and the formation of the privatised rail track. We've seen the maintenance of the track go private and then back into the nationalised rail track that became Network Rail. We've seen the centralisation of infrastructure management and shift from London to Milton Keynes, and then followed by the decentralisation into the regions which are now moving to regional smart clients for local delivery. We also now have the return of the GB Railway to Derby, uh, which uh, you haven't mentioned actually uh, tonight. And uh, I know it's delighted many railway enthusiasts. I know Ian Flynn here is very uh, 
uh, happy about it and uh, most people in Derby. We've seen various franchising models and we have heard tonight more about the plans to improve the problems from previous railway organizational setups. One thing is uh, certain in my mind, uh, change is going to happen and it's going to continue to happen. To happen. And uh, I hope you found the information from Rufus tonight useful in navigating your own path through this change. Uh, if not, perhaps we should agree a return date for an update from Rufus oh. back in maybe late 24, 25, Rufus. Yeah. <laughs> so personally, I'm encouraged by the fact that there are many experienced railway professionals within the GBRTT who understand the nuances of the complex system that is a railway, many of which I've personally worked with in the past and I've got great respect for. So I have every confidence that they will be successful and wish them all the best. Uh, Rufus will stay with us for a while yep. for the drinks reception. So if you have any more questions, you didn't get the opportunity, uh, please approach him, please be nice, and I'm sure he will oblige. Um, before we go upstairs, I've got a couple of announcements. Uh, our next evening lecture here, completely different topic. Uh, we've got, the topic is on the engineering behind a nuclear fusion energy experiment. It's by Navdeep Mehai from the UK Atomic Energy Authority. And uh, it's on the 16th of May. Please know it's not our usual second Wednesday. We had to um, abandon that slot for the following Tuesday. Um, I haven't got anything else. I wish you all a safe journey and I hope to see most of you upstairs Of course, I'm running ahead of myself. Thank you very much, Rimesh. And we do have a small memento here to show our appreciation to Rufus. So uh, I hope you'll all join me to thank him again for being here with us. I get something. Of course you do. Thank you. I'm going to have to declare this, aren't I? Is it a Maybe. gift of a trifling nature? It is, it is. Okay, thank you. I'm very grateful. <laughs> right, okay. Good night, all.